of the Western Hemisphere's Hispanic and Latino communities, which in the United States alone comprise about 58 million people. It's also our opportunity to focus attention on some of the major events, developments, and themes affecting co the contemporary Hispanic and Latin American worlds. And no single phenomenon has become more deeply interwoven in the social, political, and cultural landscape of Latin America than the sport, or I should say religion, of soccer, or el football, as it's uh, more accurately known. According to William Flaherty's article, The Politics of Football in Latin America, quote, football has dominated South American culture ever since it arrived on the continent, and in turn has led to a worldwide domination of the sport by South Americans by many measures. South American nations have won half of the 18 World Cup titles, produced per perhaps two of the most transcendent players of all time in Pele and Maradona, and captured the creative imagination of soccer fans worldwide. To offer his expert and multifaceted perspectives on this issue, we welcome today Dr. Esteban Mayorga, Assistant Professor of Spanish and Latin American Studies in the Department of Modern and Classical Languages at Niagara University. Uh, Dr. Mayorga received his bachelor's in international business, French, and English at the, I'm going to try this, Pontesia Universidad Católica del Ecuador. Thank you. <laughs> he also uh, obtained his PhD in Hispanic languages and literature from Boston College. Dr. Mayorga is a prolific travel writer and has extensively researched and lectured on Latin American, on the Latin American novel and contemporary transatlantic fiction. He has authored three fictional works, uh, Moscow, Idaho, which was published in 2015, Cuarenta, uh, which was published in 2018, and Ferra Boli, that, okay? <laughs> and he has cur currently has two nonfiction titles in the, in the works, uh, Social and Cultural Landscapes of Latin America, which is forthcoming from Rutledge, and, and this one might be more difficult, uh, Galapagos, Origen, uh, Imagineros, Heirs y Evolución Textual en las Islas Encantadas. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, which is forthcoming from Purdue University Press. Um, travel writing and the subject of the Galapagos Islands were topics of his doctoral dissertation. And every year he teaches a course on Latin American travel literature and takes students to Ecuador and the Galapagos Islands. Um, do you accept faculty audits on that, uh, on that trip? Okay. <laughs> um, he also teaches a very popular course on soccer and popular culture in South America, which is obviously what brings him uh, here today. And as this is a World Cup year, his discussion of soccer and national identity in South America is immensely timely. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Esteban Mayorga. Hello, hello everyone. Thank you, Robert, uh, for the invitation, and thank you all for coming. Um, um, and thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, I'm going to be brief. I'll, I'll talk for about 25 to 30 minutes. Uh, in the meantime, um, I'll try not to read verbatim. I'll try to uh, engage with you more. And I'm going to show two short clips, um, probably a minute and a half and two minutes each, uh, to see if I can show my, my main point. So. Um, so the first question is why, why does uh, soccer matter? Um, I forgot the point. Um, so yeah, that's the first question. Why does soccer matter? Or maybe why do sports matter um, at all, right? And um, I think we all know that sports uh, generate revenue. Um, sports also generate um, entertainment or they entertain. But um, sports also allows to learn about regional identities and historical narratives. And this is particular in Latin America because soccer, um, in a way, has created some social demand. Um, it is important also because it says something about Latin Americans that no other shape or form of cultural signifier says about them. So uh, one of the main uh, questions that I want to answer that is uh, the importance of, of sport or soccer. right? Uh, one, of the, one of the things that I want to talk about uh, specifically has to do with um, the concept of sports. Uh, specifically, uh, Pierre Bourdieu, the French sociologist, says that um, the concept we have of sports now is relatively new. It has not uh, been like that forever. 
and it goes hand in hand with the production of sports products and also with its industry. Right? He makes a very good, compelling argument about the difference between game and sport. Um, he says that the game, in a way, is not um, conditioned by profit. It is not conditioned by a salary, right? Whereas sports are conditioned by uh, being professionally paid for doing something well, right? And uh, one of the examples he gives uh, about how sports became sports has to do with the shape they take when we uh, practice sports or maybe when we consume sports or we watch them, right? Um, the main thing he says or talks about has to do with statistics and records. One of the shapes about uh, one of the things about statistics and records has to do with how scientific it makes uh, sports sound, right? In a way, um, the sport becomes something else, has a different meaning, and it becomes almost as a discipline, right? We know that there's careers that focus or specialize in sports, so. We all know as well that sports have rules, and that, that implies some kind of philosophy of the sport, right? So one of the things that we value about sports has to do with maybe uh, courage, or maybe building character, um, energy, virility, discipline, teamwork, sacrifice, time management, all those stuff that we value. But we value those, according to Bouvier, because they hold capitalistic values, right? These values are something that, was, um, that has morphed the game into the sport. And those things are not necessarily good. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, sports culture has adopted uh, these formulas to make the sport more meaningful than it actually is. That's, that's one of the reasons why I think sports are fascinating, because they're very persuasive, seductive in that sense, but also um, hold values that are not necessarily good for capitalistic, uh, for us as a society. So the context of soccer in Latin America is a little bit different. There's particularities. And the first one has to do with uh, the arrival of soccer in the 19th century to um, South America. Uh, there's a few myth, myths about how it arrived, but most people agree on the myth that it arrived in the 19th century, imported from England. Right? So it was imported from England because um, just as countries of the region were beginning to consolidate themselves, as modern nations, that is to say, they became independent from Spain in the 19th century. The, this independence created some type of void, right? Because the Spanish rule went away, they um, had this uh, urgency to fill that void, right? Spanish rule was gone, and they had this urgency to fill this void, but they wanted to fill this void with uh, modern signifiers or cultural signifiers, with civilized signifiers. That is to say, from North America or Europe, uh, not from the Iberian Peninsula, right? From Europe, I mean France, uh, France or England, right? Or, or any other European country that was not part of the Iberian Peninsula, right? So um, changes were intended to make Latin America look more like Europe. They wanted to become more like Europe in this sense. And um, this perceived lack, lack of modernity or civilization uh, from the part of Latin American countries right after independence created um, uh, the, the urge to import some models. So they imported uh, a few models, for instance, the education model um, that most Latin American countries use these days is imported from the French, right? The same way as the incarceration system was imported from North America, right? These models at this time were really important for them because it gave them the idea of belonging to some sort of cosmopolitanism or some sort of civilization or modern, modernity that was not really there. But among these models, they also wanted to import cultural models or signifiers. And that's where soccer comes in. It was imported uh, as, as a way to, to think or to give the illusion that they were actually competing with Europe or North America, right? And in this sense, um, I have this phrase here from Joshua Nadell, who is a professor in Florida who, who talks about soccer. Um, he says that the sport, soccer, came to embody the nation because soccer and the nation grew and evolved together. Right? So the Latin American nations were founded in the 19th century, right after independence, and that's exactly when soccer started being popular in these countries. So there are a few approaches to this, but the main one um, that I already talked about a little bit has to be with capitalist interpretation. There's two other ones that I would like to talk to you. Uh, about. So the first one has to do with the political interpretation of soccer in Latin America. Um, one of the main things that people 
uh, know about soccer, or the people hate or love about it, is that it distracts the masses from the daily hardships. There's a famous uh, Marx, Marx's aphorisms, uh, as you might remember, concerning religion. Religion is the opium of the masses. Uh, there's a saying in Latin America, people say soccer is the opium of the masses because it actually distracts you from whatever you're going through. It's, it's a parenthesis between your daily routine. It allows you to uh, stop working, stop worrying, stop stressing, go to a game and do whatever you do at the game, right? So this is important because it's an extremely economical means of mobilizing, occupying, and controlling the masses. It is a very good instrument, a very good platform to sway people or to convince people or to persuade them because it's very, very dear to them, right? Because of the historical narrative that I was talking about. And the other one has to do with the national interpretation, which is particular to Latin America because it is a very good vehicle for national sentiment, right? And in this sense, it has this historical narrative from the 19th century that it's still alive today, right? People value this a lot. So, um, so the first thing, of course, that um, I want to ask you, because one might say, this is not particular to South America or Latin America because we love sports here in America as well, right? So where, where does the love um, for sports in general come from? And that's, that's a good question, I think. Um, what do you think? Where does, if you like American football, for instance, where do you think your love for American football comes from? Um, any Bills fans? Is the Bills? Is, well, <laughs> there's a couple. <laughs> where does your love for the Bills come from? I don't know. I'm asking you. Didn't mean to put you on the spot, but... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and that's exactly the, the kind of answer um, I was looking for. So it's important to you because of your family. Maybe your parents, maybe your brothers and sisters or siblings uh, love it. And it's, that's a very, very usual. Yes? That's a good point. That's a very good point because spaces create affections as well, not just people, right? So spaces create affections as well. And I think that's, that's very important. Um, and. Uh, the question for the Bills um, is important as well because no matter, uh, no, I don't want to be offensive, but the Bills, do they win? I, I don't think they ever win. No, but people never <laughs> stop cheering for them, right? So that's, 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 a, that's a point. Uh, my point is that um, the affection for a team um, is, in a way, always there. No matter if they win or lose, you're always going to be a fan of that, of that team, right? And I think it's because the affection of the family is stronger than any other cultural affection in this sense, right? So at the micro level within the household, you have this affection through your family, and that expands through the neighborhood, right? So if you play in the streets or if you're playing the game on the, on the school and stuff, it expands to the neighborhood. And then it expands to the city where there's a, probably a local team. And then finally, it expands or it's an extension of the country when the national team plays, right? So this is an expansive wave that traverses a bunch of um, uh, places and people that um, tends to be more valuable as it expands, right? So I think um, family and neighborhood uh, create this cultural identity. And I think just as club teams operate as extensions of the neighborhood, national teams become extensions of the country. And this is particular in Latin America through the World Cup. As you, as you might already know. And I think it happens in the US as well. If you look at the Olympics, when, uh, when the US teams are uh, you know, playing against other teams, um, there's usually this sentiment, I, I believe, um, particular, in particular, right? So the hypothesis has to do with this. If sports could be used um, to mobilize a population to craft a new image of the nation in Latin America, as it happened in the 19th century, then they must have some potential to reflect tensions, conflicts, and challenges of this society, right? So it is important. I think there's a truth in soccer that cannot be accessible through any other means. That's what I'm trying to say, right? So I think soccer ended up playing an important role in fostering a sense of national community and rapid economic, political, and demographic changes in Latin America, specifically in the 19th century, right? Um, so this is where the, where the, <laughs> sorry, I'm late. <laughs> this is where the playing styles come in. I don't know. Um, this is a hypothesis as well, but I think it's a good one in the sense that um, uh, there's there's an idea that some teams play a certain way, not based on efficiency of winning, but mostly on identity, right? So I don't know. If there's local teams or any other type of teams that are 
known to be always come back at the last minute. I don't know, maybe that's a trait, maybe it's not, but that's an idea, for instance. The, 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 the counter argument has to do with uh, is this real or is this a crafted narrative, right? And that's when the plane starts in Latin America come in, specifically because there's a, there's a narrative uh, that adheres to certain nations playing certain ways because that ha that's how um, that nation is supposed to be defined culturally, demographically, in social class, and, and, the, and everything else, right? So the first example I have here for that, um, how to reinforce the nationalist sentiment through sport, um, specifically, um, has to do with the national styles of playing. So each team, for instance, Brazil plays a certain way, Uruguay plays a certain way, uh, Peru plays a certain way, and so forth, right? And there's names for this, and I think this is where um, where the study or the or the or the research um, shows something really really interesting, right? So the name for the for the way the Brazilians play has to do with uh, the the statics of the game. It's o jogo bonito, which means the beautiful game, right? Literally, it means the beautiful game. And supposedly Brazilians play uh, beautifully. I mean, it's pleasing to watch, right? Which is if we were to compare it to let's say German teams that are very efficient but they don't play aesthetically beautiful. And that's, that's arguable, right? That's arguable for sure. But that's the argument in a sense that the Jogo Bonito, or the beautiful game, is something of a trademark of Brazilians, where it's not necessarily of other teams, specifically European teams, right? The European teams might be really good and efficient and win, but they don't play beautifully, according to this hypothesis. So, so I have a clip that I would like to show you now concerning this Jogo Bonito. And it's only a minute and a half. So we'll talk about that real quick. I mean, we'll watch the clip real quick, and then we'll try to discuss a little bit of the traits that they're supposed to show as an identity marker when they play, right? So hopefully technology collaborates. So this is, uh, as, you, as you might have uh, noticed, it, it's actually an ad, it's a commercial. Uh, but there's several things that are important here. The, the main one, at least, has to do with um, the flags and the uniforms, right? Those are national team, uh, the national team of Brazil wears that uniform always. And there's uh, Brazilian flags in the back. But also the music, what kind of music do you, do you know what that is? Do you recognize it? It's samba, exactly. Samba is the national team, uh, the national music, or, or the most important music, specifically in the cliché <laughs> viewpoint, from the cliché viewpoint of Brazil. But it's mixed with hip hip hop, right? In a way, um, it's very catchy. Um, the uniform, the flag, and all that stuff. That is to say, all the symbols of the Brazilian identity that are based on clichés, right? And I think they're very seductive. The hypothesis with the playing, the national style of playing of Brazilians has to do with the idea that they play 
the same way they are, and the way they are is they're always dancing. That would be an idea of this, right? So, I, I'm, and I'm showing this just, just to make sure that um, we, um, we look at the aesthetics of, of, the, of the game, but specifically in this, in this place, um, has to do with some concept of aesthetics according to Hegel. I'm, and I'm just going to be super brief quoting Hegel here because in 1835 in his aesthetics, he talks about uh, the body. And I think that's a very important part because as we saw on the previous slide, uh, this idea of the sport came to embody the nation. I think it's quite, quite telling. Um, I'm quoting from Hegel here. Art could be a sensuous form of an idea, he says. And he defines sensuous as a relating to the sense, relating to the senses, rather than the intellect, right? So, so sensuous could be something that uh, it relates to whatever you, you capture through your phenomena, what's happening, not necessarily to something that you think, but also it's attractive or gratifying physically. That's how he describes sensuous. So, so art is pleasing according to Hegel um, because it relates to your senses, and also because it is attractive. And it is super important because an idea is shown through art as something sensuous, right? And I think the human body is a sensuous concrete object as well. And I think part of the reason why we like sports or that we like uh, people doing stuff they do through sports is because the body of these people is attractive, is seductive in a way. I don't mean necessarily sexually, but I think there's something there that relates to the aesthetic of the body, right? So I think part of that, um, when we see these amazing bodies doing amazing things that we cannot do, it attracts us. It, it, we want to be part of that, right? Specifically, if it's important to you through a historical narrative, like the way it is from, uh, from the perspective of Latin American identity, right? So that's, that's the first, first example of, of the Brazilian Jogo Bonito, which is a playing style that Brazilians um, are known for. I have the second example, um, and I think it's, it's also based um, on, the, um, on the national narrative of Uruguay. Uruguay, as you know, is a tiny country of three million people, but they're really good at soccer. They're a huge superpower when it comes to soccer. And they're known for playing in a certain style that it's kind of quite the opposite of the Brazilian style. And it's called the Garra Charrua. And I'm not going to explain this after we watch, uh, I'll explain this after we watch the short clip. It's also really, really uh, brief. So my apologies because the video is part in English, part in Spanish, and Spanish does not have subtitles. But it's this is actually another ad, and it's asking your way and to uh, upload a video uh, explaining what the Garra Charrua is, right? Um, and this is this is important because it came right before uh, the World Cup in Russia this year, and I think um, it does not um, explain what it is. The winner of the of the of this contest because it's it's an ad for a contest to submit the video explaining this. Um, is, is called Gol en la hora, which is goal, goal at the last minute. And uh, it's just, um, it defines it that winning against all odds 
and all adversities and still be triumphant. Never give up. Impossible does not exist. That's how they, your Wayans define their playing style of soccer, the Garra Charru, right? But I think, um, in, in a way, um, this idea of being uh, super um, uh, triumphant, even though all adversities are against you and uh, it's impossible to win, it's impossible to beat Germany, impossible to beat Argentina, and they, they believe that they have this playing style that allows them to do that, I think it's a crafted illusion. I don't think, for instance, that your Wayans play with more heart, because what Garra Charruek actually means is playing with a lot of heart, never giving up. I don't think your Wayans play with more heart than Paraguayans, for that matter. Right? So my question when I was looking at this research and this had to do with who created this crafted illusion that the playing style is actually real, that this, these teams, uh, Brazil or Uruguay, have to play this certain way, right? And I, 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 I have this question, it's a sincere question to you as well, right? So do you believe in specific playing styles determined by tradition? Like maybe your local team plays a certain way because it's determined by that tradition. If you have Polish descent, like most people do in, in Buffalo, not most people, a lot of people do in Buffalo, they have this certain uh, tradition that conditions the way some, some teams play the way they do and so forth, right? And, and I think um, if, if the question were to be framed, um, in terms of believing that a national team uh, has a soccer style, most people would say yes in Latin America, right? However, the research shows otherwise, that it's just a crafted illusion. So then the question becomes, who created this narrative that these teams need to play a certain style, right? And how did it become so popular and why it's important? So we have other examples. Argentina has this playing style called La Nuestra, right? Um, same as Brazil and Uruguay, they have their own specific particularities and so forth, right? So the hypothesis has to do with people of different ethnic and national heritage play a different form of the game based on national styles, right? And that, I think that's false. I don't think that Brazilians play a certain way. I don't think Uruguayans play a certain way, right? I think um, it's, there's schools of coaching that might seem like that is true, but in, in reality, I think national styles of playing are not necessarily determined by tradition. They're more determined by other factors, right? So, so the answer, at least partial answer, has to do with the national styles of playing being crafted historical creations. And these were invented when Latin American countries were grappling with identity in the 19th century, specifically after being independent from Spain. Um, I think the national style embodied the composition of the nation and that it was able to surpass the supposedly superior European race. And in this sense, it makes total, total sense. Um, because um, remember, we talked about how after independence from Spain, these nations wanted to become more modern, right? Being free from Spain, they wanted to become more modern, looking through North, to North America, looking to Europe. And soccer allowed them to maybe feel that, right? Specifically, if they were to play an important team and beat that European nation through soccer, it allowed them to be at the same spot. It allowed them to give the illusion of being cosmopolitan, modern, civilized, so forth, right? So I have another example of the relation between identity and playing style that has to do with a specific uh, morphology of the actual game, and that is the corner kick. I have, I have here um, uh, some research done by a couple of journalists in England, and this research is, is not super sophisticated or rigorous, but it, it, it's, it's very telling, right? So they, they analyzed uh, a bunch of corner kicks. And uh, there's many ways to, to shoot uh, the corner kick. But they divided the corner kicks, or the way they were, um, the, the teams um, <clears throat> were doing the corner kicks, into the inswinger or the outswinger. That is to say, one that is closer to the pole when you kick uh, the corner kick, or the one that goes further away from the pole, people maybe trying to score, right? And um, they, they looked at statistics, and uh, they tried to see which one was more effective in, in scoring, right? And the hypothesis first was, and it's always been, that the outswinger corner kick is way more effective, because there's more chances of people touching the ball, because there's more players within, further from the pole, right? From the goal, I'm sorry, right? So in this sense, most people believe that the outswinger corner kick was more effective in scoring, right? But the statistic showed otherwise, that inswinger corner kicks are more effective in scoring, right? 
However, most corner kicks were shot or taken um, through um, the outswinger. There were, there were people, uh, players were kicking the ball towards the outswinger corner kick, right? Even though knowingly, uh, knowing statistically that the inswinger has more chances of scoring, right? So the question then becomes, why would a football player, soccer player, kick the ball to the outswinger corner kick or use that corner kick, knowingly that the other corner kick or the other way of shooting the ball leads to more scoring, right? And that's, that's a very valid question, I think, specifically because we are very eager to know statistics. We're very, very thinking that statistics, statistics actually show something that is closer to the truth, right? And that's my question to you. Why do you think um, a, a certain player would do something um, that it is not as effective in scoring compared to another way of playing, right? Um, any takers? I don't know. It's a valid question because I made that question to myself. And, uh, and the question has to do a little bit with this identity uh, stuff we've been talking about. But what do you think? Why would a soccer player or maybe any player of any other team play a certain way knowingly, um, knowing that um, it is not as effective? It's not necessarily going to score if you were to do the other thing. Safer. That's a good hypothesis. Feel safer in what way? It's probably not as crowded out there, less chance of the other team getting the ball. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. I can definitely see that. Yeah. Any others? Because it is what they were taught to do. Yes, it usually, um, yes. And another one? Yes, yes. So maybe it's difficult to get to that. Yes. Yes, and I, think, and I think the research that these journalists did has many variables that are not very convincing in a way, right? It also depends on the, the size of your team. If, if the players are taller, it's, we have more chances of, of scoring with your head and so forth. Um, it depends also on who kicks the ball and so forth. But I think, um, and at least the partial answer has to do with how it looks. And I think Fernando here gave also another good sign. You were taught to, 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 to use the outswinger uh, corner kick because um, it, it means that more players are involved if you do that, right? Usually that's what it means, right? Even though scoring using the inswinger might be important, most people think soccer is a collective thing. But also because the outswinger looks better it looks more spectacular. There's more, there's more time of playing. And that's the actual um, hypothesis or answer that uh, soccer players and coaches uh, as well are still worried about the aesthetics of the game. They're still worried about the identity, the cultural part of the game. They want to show good, a good performance. And I think that's really, um, that's really fascinating in a way, right? So the, the example specifically here has to do with um, there's still some suspicion of numbers in soccer. I don't think this is across the board, but it, it still happens. That is to say, some coaches sign a player based on the player's popularity, more so than his actual statistical record, right? And I don't know if this happens or might happen here as well in, in America, but I think most people will be inclined to obey the statistical record, more so than the actual identity of the player. If, the player is good and popular, that would be good marketing, but not necessarily good for the team, right? But there's widespread suspicion of numbers in soccer. That's what Cooper and Szymanski, the two journalists uh, who did the study, um, say. And I think it's, it's true. And I think we can say that soccer managers or coaches still choose their, their players, sometimes based on identity and not necessarily on statistics. And I think that's fascinating because it resists some shape, in some shape or form, this, these capitalistic values we were talking about at the beginning of the talk, right? So, um, so this, is, this is important, and I think we, yeah, we can all agree that um, we, we might be able to, to see this maybe in other sports as well. And that's the, main, the next question, or at least the question I would like to ask or address. Why do we choose one sport uh, over another? And this is, this is the part where um, 
it might be difficult to see or not, specifically in the context of Latin American politics and identity. But why do we choose one sport? I mean, one reason might be because our family likes this sport or not, and you're a fan of this sport or not, and so forth. And that's a totally valid reason as any other, right? But I think there's a particular distribution of sporting factors. And this is uh, Bourdieu's theory of sports and social class. And I think it's important um, for us to, to see this. What are the particular distribution of sporting factors, meaning that not all sports are accessible to everyone, right? Specifically because there's a few factors that are not equitable. They're not the same for us than for anybody else. And that is particular um, in the Western world or, or not, but it's also important to understand. Specifically because we have the first time, you know, we need spare time, for instance, to play sports. Um, what else do you think we need to play sports in addition to the time? Equipment, equipment exactly. And that is certainly if you play, I don't know, hockey. Anybody plays hockey here? Yeah, a few people? Yeah. Um, um, I, I, I've never played hockey. I don't know. I, 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 it's hard for me to see the puck when I see it on TV. So I, I'm thankful for the light when they score. There's a light, so I know they score <laughs> because it's so fast. But I'm assuming that the gear is really expensive, right? So you need economic capital. In addition to spare time, which is also uh, something valuable because we don't have time, uh, we also need economic capital. That is to say ac uh, accessibility to the gear, and the gear is expensive, right? And then we need something else. And that's when, when uh, things get a little complicated. But what else do you think we need to choose one sport over another? Talent. Talent is a good one. Yes, yes. And I think it's related to the third point, which is cultural capital. And uh, the particularities of cultural capital in the sense, at least of Latin America, are very unequal. These are not the same for everyone, and they vary widely according to class. The typical example has to do with diet, but also you can see uh, through golf, for instance, that's also a typical example, right? In order to play golf, you need, in addition to spare time and economic capital, you need maybe to belong to a club to actually go and play, right? And uh, maybe the particularities of golf are not the same here as they are in Latin America, but the gap between people who can actually play golf or not is huge. And I think, um, there, this, is, this is part of why soccer, some people in, in Latin America hate it or love it. In a sense, it gives this illusion of, um, of traversing or going up uh, a sporting career representing one of the few paths of upward mobility open to the children of the dominated classes, right? But it's totally false, right? The idea that a sport can be an opportunity for upward mobility, I think, is also close here in America. It's, it's also something that's alive, I think. And I think it's, it's a total illusion. The same way the crafted narrative tells us that certain teams need to play a certain way, uh, there's also a crafted narrative that tells you that your only way out of um, your neighborhood is to play a sport well. But that's a total illusion. And I think the Latin American uh, cultural capital that I want to talk about here um, to end the talk um, are complicated, right? There's uh, many added components to this that make it une uh, unequal. Right? The first one has to do with uh, the legacy of the pre-Columbian culture. So we know um, before the Spanish arrived in Latin America, the Incas, the Aztecs, and the Mayas were there. Right? But then we have the component of the European migration, so from Spain and Portugal. Right? And then we have an African presence. So this makes a heterogeneous cultural capital that some people think that soccer traverses and in involves everybody in a collective way that is good, but it's actually not good. You can see the national team of Colombia, for instance, that has a bunch of African-Americans playing for them, but they have no participation in social life, in, in, in the actual political entourage or, or climate, right? And, and you can go on and on about these inequalities, right? So uh, to, to, to end the talk, I would like to, to reflect upon the, the need to understand how these cultural capitals relate to each other today and how the Indian legacy, for instance, and peasants and urban popular cultures are appropriated by dominant and subordinate sectors, and how they become recontextualized and invested with new meaning to serve the interests of these various sectors. Um, and I think um, the multinational logic of culture under these uh, capitalistic values, uh, specifically uh, when they morph into sports, that we think it's something good, right? 
uh, and practices forms um, ways of life that our societies do not appropriate their lost or expropriated cultural capital. What I'm trying to say is that um, sometimes um, sports um, are seen as an illusion or a crafting of something good that we value, but they're actually not that good, specifically for unequal societies. Um, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good hypothesis, and it's a very technical one. I think part of what happens in Argentina or way in Brazil is that most of their players um, um, at the age, when they're teens or so forth, they go to Europe. Um, and what happens is usually um, uh, a European team uh, or scout, European um, uh, teams uh, have scouts everywhere, specifically in those three countries because of the school, soccer, tradition, and so forth. And what happens is that most um, European players um, go to European teams at a very early age, right? And that's their dream. They want to do that. Usually when they get to Europe, um, they are on the bench, usually for a while. Unless you're really good, you get to play a lot. So they're on the bench, and then they sign up for another team and so forth, blah, blah, blah. They make a little bit of money, and then they come back to your way. Sometimes if they're good, they play for the national team or not. But that school, that transition, gives them the tools or techniques specifically to play differently. It's a different school of training. And that's, sometimes that's a hypothesis that makes them stronger, in a way. But they also, in your way, have very good schools of soccer. So they play at a very early age. Everybody plays all the time. Um, and I think, I think um, in, the, in the particular case of your way, there's this pride for being a small nation, but a superpower in soccer that feeds itself and it, and it produces a bunch of, of players that are taken very seriously. It's not just a hobby, it's like a professional thing. Uh, but I think, I think your hypothesis might be valuable, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's part of the cultural capital I was talking about in the end, so... Um, uh, I think soccer in the U.S. is actually booming, right? But you, you don't have, don't look at the MLS because that's not a really good way to measure it. I think um, the U.S. does really well in World Cups, specifically the women's team, right? So I think here soccer is actually quite big. It's never going to replace football or baseball or basketball, and that's actually the point, right? So to have an alternate, alternative. And um, I think... Um, its cultural and its historical importance are huge. And throwing maybe a lot of resources and money to, to a cultural signifier is not going to make it boom, because it's actually something that people need to develop a passion or affection to. That, right? So and I think it, it is here, uh, and it's booming. But I think um, it, sometimes it's difficult to see, because we have sports for every season already, and it's hard to compete with those. Right? But I think uh, the US, whenever it gets to the World Cup, it does really well, and it does well. It does better than a bunch of Latin American countries, right? And the same, I would think, would go, or even better, for the women's uh, national team of soccer. That they've, they've been uh, world champions at least once, I, I remember. I don't know if twice, but they always make it to the finals and so forth. So it's, it's actually booming, and it's happening. And that's part of the discussion also, part of soccer and gender. In Latin America specifically, women's sports are not taken as seriously and because of marketing, because of other things, but I think it's also because of this cultural capital that's very patriarchal. And that might be a little bit diffused or deconstructed in the US. It might play out differently, even though it's still uh, glass ceiling and gender differences. It might be played out a, a little different, but uh, I don't know if I answered your question. But <laughs> uh, are American 
the universities and colleges more actively recruiting uh, soccer athletes? Um, I, I don't know that for a fact. I don't know numbers. Uh, I, would, I would think so. Uh, I know it's a big, um, uh, for Latin Americans, um, I'm generalizing here, so I shouldn't do that, but for South Americans, maybe for Ecuadorians, I'm Ecuadorian, but I think um, uh, going to school by playing soccer would be a dream, right? It would be like your dream come true because you have this scholarship and you get to study in the States or you get to study somewhere else. So I would, I would be surprised if they were not, um, you know, American universities wouldn't be capitalizing on that. But I don't really know the numbers or the actual, you know, statistics. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, why? Than any other sport? Yeah, I think because of um, um, uh, the, the cultural significance. It started in the 19th century and it came to develop while the nation was developing and it got this importance of being cosmopolitan, modern, and so forth. And then it became something that um, people measure their actual cultural culture through it. So when, in, for instance, I'll give you an example. Um, so Argentina was in, uh, went to war against England um, for the Falkland Islands in the 80s. And um, in 1986, the World Cup in Mexico took place. And uh, the quarterfinals, Argentina had to play England. And that was a huge game. And Maradona was still playing, right? And two things happened at that game. So the first one, they had gone to war. And Argent Argentina lost the war uh, two years prior to the game. Uh, and the first thing that happened was that uh, Maradona scored an illegal goal using his hand. Uh, so the, 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 the goalie is like, he was like six feet six, and then Maradona is like five five, and he beat the goalie, uh, apparently using his head, but he used his hand to score the goal. And the ref didn't see it, and it was a valid goal. So the Argentines were winning, and uh, Maradona would later say that was the hand of God, right? That was his saying, because it's revenge for these folk. But then after that goal, which was uh, cheating, uh, Maradona uh, scored arguably the best goal, the best goal in the entire uh, soccer, in his entire soccer career, which was he dribbled for, I think six or seven English players, and he beat Shil Peter, Peter Shilton, which was the who was the goalie, and he actually scored the goal. And the idea behind that was to define Latin America in the sense that okay, so we can cheat, we're corrupt, and we do that, but we're also very talented. We can beat England if we want to. Either way, of course, they have more money and more resources to win the war. But we actually did that. And people um, still love Maradona. That, that goal is always played. It's been 20, 30 years. And that goal has always come to the discussion. Part of that, because the narrator who captured that goal is a guy who's like a poet. And he, he, he narrated the goal in such a way that people just love it. But that's an example of how people, um, how these um, playing styles or, or values are crafted right, through these types of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I haven't read that much about baseball. But I know for a fact that some Central American countries uh, started playing baseball when there was U.S. interventions there. Of course, these interventions were not amicable at all, right? But um, one of the things that uh, still happen in Latin America is that there's this desire to be part of the world discussion, to be part of the, of the cosmopolitanism of North America, of Europe. And sometimes people appropriate these things. So the cultural signifier of baseball in Panama, for instance, is huge. Same thing if you go to Mexico on the northern part of, of the border, you see people playing baseball, not soccer. But if you go southern, southern um, to the south part of Mexico, you see people playing um, soccer. So I think um, uh, a paradoxical thing here would, would happen in Cuba, right? So baseball is bigger in Cuba than it is um, no, some, in many other countries, Venezuela as well and so forth. So I think the Caribbean occupation of the U.S. had a lot to do with it. And it was not amicable. So, yes? What's the, um, what's the health of uh, club soccer like in Brazil or Argentina? When there's so much for the national identity, and then players are being shipped off when they're young and trained in the European youth academies. Uh, now, Boca, yeah, you can know Boca Juniors, West River plays, and, and some of those clubs. So, what's the. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, like, it's like Robert was saying, it's a religion. So what happens in, in, these, um, in these particular clubs is that they, um, they have schools for kids, and these kids grow up and be really good and have very rigorous training and so forth. And um, to actually sustain the club, of course, there's a bunch of things like uh, T-shirts, the game tickets, and so forth. But the main uh, source of revenue is actually selling the young player to the European club. So it's really important for them to, um, to have that. And um, usually what happens is that um, they have, um, the roster is good, and they have enough to sell the, 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 the guy to a European team and keep a good player. But people attend the games all the time. There's a lot of violence involved as well. There's a lot of corruption. There's a lot of like a mobster type of thing, very patriarchal. Um, and I think um, I, it's difficult to generalize, but usually, um, usually, there, there are also teams that are connected to other things that are not related to sports, right? Political or, or uh, maybe businesses and so forth. So there's a lot of in investments there that, that keep these teams going as well. Yeah. Yeah, people, um, to these days, people, some people think that they should give back the 1978 World Cup to the FIFA, because Argentina was under a dictatorship, right? And it was organized by the government to actually hide what the government was doing, which was torturing and killing people, right? So some people these days still argue that you should give back the World Cup. That was not a real thing. It was, not, it was just all set up and so forth. Um, I think um, part of the discrepancies are part of why people, a lot of people in, in Latin America hate soccer in a way, it's because it, it, it is a platform that, you know, sometimes works against you or as a society. It is not productive, it is not um, ethic, right? And I think um, you touched upon a very good point. And, um, and uh, I, 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 don't, I don't really know exactly um, uh, how to negotiate that specifically because every country has its different history, but it's always happened. It happened in Chile as well. They used the national stadium to incarcerate people and then torture them. It's happened, it happened numerous times, and the politics intersecting these, uh, these sport uh, events and so forth, that people don't know how to deal with that in a way, yeah. Thank you. you mentioned uh, soccer you was know, booming in the US and you cheer for the big year, but in Latin America when it came to lose, these fans crying, where does that Yeah, um, mm, part of it, I think, it has to do with the historical narrative of founding the nation through soccer and so forth. And also part of it has to do with, uh, with the, um, the distraction factor. I say um, it is seen as a, as a fiesta. Fiesta in Spanish means party, but not only party. It means something else, right? It's seen almost as a holiday when the national team plays or when a good team plays. And that um, whatever's at stake at, a, at an important game is beyond sports. And I think um, it provides this parenthetical thing that you act and behave a certain way, and emotions are higher than regular sports events that are not necessarily soccer related. So I think part of it has to do with the historical narrative close to you that you like because it's part of your founding nation. And part of it is because it provides this parenthetical event that uh, changes your behavior and makes you you know, more emotional about things. Um, and that varies according to country, and that's why also a lot of people <laughs> um, actually don't like the sport, because sometimes people don't show up to work. But sometimes even the president signs an executive order when the national team's playing, saying that oh, only half day tomorrow, because our national team's playing, right? Which is something that's maybe unthinkable other, in other places, yeah. Um, I would add that uh, also, uh, especially with um, uh, local clubs of soccer in a city. I would say also that there's a pride goal, like a family pride, yes. in the sense that we say, well, you can change your religion, but you won't never change your soccer. <laughs> True. <laughs> really. <laughs> yeah. Great way to put it. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> So a lot of government sort of um, 
subsidization and support for this sport in South America in a way that we don't see sort of in the northern hemisphere where it's more capitalistic, more commercially driven? Because I mean, you, you sort of make a really strong case as for the political and social um, uh, benefits that, that, that come with this creating more the, the sense of, you know, um, national unity, perpetuating this myth of upward mobility when it doesn't exist. It's this bread and circuses kind of an historian. <laughs> bread and circuses kind of, you know, ancient Roman, mm -hmm. kind of, there's, there's so much political mileage to be gained from this. Do we see this sort of government step up and, you know, support it even if it's not commercially viable in some, in some mm, um, I think it varies according to country, right? But one of the things that did happen was that soccer remained um, not transparent. The, the, the administration of soccer, clubs and teams, was not transparent at all. In a way, it was like a mafia up until recently, I think. Right? And part of it was because it generates so much money and it generates so much political capital that they wanted to keep it unchecked precisely because it would be easy to you know, manipulate. It was not checked by the government. So the government stayed away for a while. But then there's a few federations that are starting, you know, uh, not necessarily subsidizing, but controlling it more because it doesn't need subsidies. It's, it makes plenty of money. Uh, but that's the other thing. It's also exploitation because most uh, professional soccer players, um, maybe not in Brazil, maybe not in, in Argentina, but in most countries, do not make a lot of money, right? In, if they play in that in the local league, right? Depending where you play and depending if, so, so they don't make a lot of money. They make okay. So, but it's not the exorbitant amounts of money that we know that they made here. So, uh, in a way, um, the government started intervening, um, not for subsidies or to, uh, to invest, but mostly to control it, because it was out of control. And it was a lot of cases of corruption and, and lot, lots of cases of, um, of abuse of power. The main example that always people talk about has to do with the Paraguayan FIFA representative, uh, Nicolás Leos, who who, I don't know, somehow he managed to build the FIFA headquarters of South America in Paraguay, which is one of the most inaccessible nations of, of South America. And people are like, how did you pull that off? And uh, what, he did many things, bribes and all that stuff, but he, one of the things he did was he gave, he had so much power that he gave diplomatic uh, passports to a bunch of his the friends who were investing in that, right? So they could travel anywhere all the time, which is, giving a diplomatic passport is only a matter of state, right? It's not a matter of, like, the FIFA president of anything. So that's the amount of power that he had in order to do that. Of course, he went to jail and he was captured after that, but, but we, we recently had the FIFA scandal here in the U.S. And they only caught him because they did the wire through a U.S. bank, right? That was the only mistake they made, but a lot, a lot of money, and because of that, they went to jail and, and they were captured. But, um, so I would think it was out of control, and the state um, did not control it sufficiently, and I think that's changed quite a bit. But I wouldn't be surprised if um, a bunch of countries used that platform as political capital, for sure. Yeah. There's a few articles about the nomenclature. Yes, uh, the, the explanation has to do, and it's a hypothesis, I don't know, that um, it was called football to begin with by everybody. And then um, the US started calling it soccer. Um, sorry, it was called soccer in the, Anglo um, in the English speaking world. And then um, the, um, the European nations and England in particular uh, um, still kept calling it football. And then to differentiate both from space and, and sophistication and everything, other countries started calling it soccer, and it depends where you align to and so forth. And I think, um, um, I, I, I don't remember the, the, the conclusion of the article, but um, the idea was that um, uh, by using a new nomenclature or using a new name, it was going to be like a marketing technique of the new, of something new that's coming, a new sport to America coming that might you know, not conflict with American football, right? And I think um, it didn't work really well, but I think, uh, <laughs> yeah, everybody calls it football, yeah, because you actually use your feet, right? <laughs> As opposed to American football, but maybe not that much, yeah. Good point. Yeah, that's uh, right. So a couple of years ago, we actually saw a Brazilian rap beheaded during soccer game, if you recall that? No, really. 
Uh, I believe this was right before um, or right after either the World Cup, whatever was to be held in Brazil. Um, how often do instances of, of violence actually occur on a soccer field to a player, to a ref, and does it have a significant impact on, on the positivity of the sport? Yeah, so the actual, the, the known violent fans are the hooligans in England, right? Much more than the Latin American fans. But that's not common. To be head a, a ref, it's not common at all. The main uh, violent uh, portion of soccer was in the 80s in Colombia because um, uh, the narcos, you know, the, the drug lords, um, specifically Escobar, he bought, he bought a couple teams. He had a few teams, but the main team he bought was uh, Atletico de Medellin, who came up to be, uh, went to be the um, winner of the, of the Libertadores, which is like the champions if, of South America. And that guy um, actually had a ref killed, but that was uh, before instance, um, uh, later instances in other players and so forth. And later we, they found out that he, you know, bribed, coerced, and everything in his power to actually be champion and then to play. And then he hired a bunch of foreign players and so forth to make that. Uh, but that was the 80s uh, in Colombia, which was the most violent epoch of all time. So it's not common to do that. And uh, people, uh, usually, you, you can still go to a game with your kids. It's totally fine. Specifically, you need to sit at, at particular places. You can't sit with, you know, the, where there's the, the base that cheers all the time. You can't sit there if you're not a really hardcore fan because it's really nasty. And it depends. In Brazil or Argentina, maybe you're not allowed to go with certain color shirts. You know, you have to support one or the other team or maybe neutral, but it depends where you sit and so forth. Um, the violent portion of the game is actually kind of controlled. It's not that bad, as you see on TV. That's why it makes the news whenever it's violent. It makes the news because it's not common. Yeah. So what you say, where are you saying that sports sometimes not only don't help inequality, but also make it worse? For example, if you have a team like, like the Colombian team, where you have uh, black players that make it seem like they're included in society when they're not, uh -huh. or for any other reason. Yes, I think. I think that's, that's part of the problem. In a way, it makes it look like there's participation uh, from all classes or inclusion when there's actually not. Um, and the, the, the bad part of that, uh, or at least a portion of that, has to do with the idea that people think, uh, who, people of, of, of low re lower resources think that that's the only way out of upward mobility, when we know statistically that less than 1% of people make it to the pros. Right? So, so I think it's a disfavor. It's a, it's a bad thing in that sense. Um, you need to, you know, really think about it uh, before jumping to those conclusions. Yeah. Okay, we better wrap it up so students get to their two o'clock class. But thank you very much for. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs>